the common tongue it says. One board to play them all. One board to bind them. A1 is roughly 23 by 33 inches. So for £41.6p, we get a playing area of 46 by 66 inches, easily big enough for combat patrol, that's really easy to store. I started by drilling some holes for some magnets. These were just to help make it easier to line up the boards, completely unnecessary, although I might add some more at a later date for a little bit of added security when playing. A size paper or ISO 216 actually dates back to a German scientist called George Christoph Lichtenberg in 1786. All of the ISO paper sizes work on the aspect ratio of the square root of 2. So this just means as long as we cut through the longest side directly through the middle, we'll produce two of the next smaller sizes in the sequence. I'm going to use this little bit of math to my advantage because this board needs to be completely random. Absolutely no discernible street patterns can be seen on this board at all. The foam was cut into A7 sheets and the depth was reduced from the 10 millimeters to somewhere between four and six. That can be quite rough. In fact, works out better if it is quite rough. But now I need to cut these in half again. Now we are down to A8 and it's time to introduce some more of that sexy mathematics. I'm going to use sequential percentages to work out exactly how many bricks I need. 54% of the board will be covered in the smallest bricks, 6% in the largest bricks, which is roughly 888 bricks per A1 board. That's a lot of bricks, and they range from A9 to A12. Although technically, A11 and A12 don't really exist. The scale goes from A0, which is the size of the board we're building, to A10. After getting all that mess tidied up, I started drawing out a grid on this next board. The grid's based on A7 sizes, which conveniently gives me an 8x8 eight eight grid, and that's given me an idea for another build. But the reason for it here is to keep me organised. I want to lay the bricks completely randomly, so having this grid will allow me some consistency in the chaos. Some of the bricks in the centre, they need to follow a particular structure to line up with the other board, but the rest of it, completely random. We start by lining up some of the pattern work where the two boards meet, and when we run out of bricks, I just use an old hot chocolate tub as a tumbler with some big stones in them. The stones I like to use are actually tarmac and gravel mix. Over time, you'll see bits of those tarmac break off and they give some really, really good texture. Eventually, I end up with this. All these little gaps are intentional. They help add to the randomness of the brick pattern. And once I've filled all these up with tiny little foam bricks, it's time to take this outside. I bought a new toy, but as you can see, I haven't quite figured it out yet. Anyway, what I did here was using an old brush into the gaps between each of these little small stones, brushed in a combination of grout and sand. This then gets covered in homemade scenic glue, one part Mod Podge, three parts water, a little bit of dish soap, and for flow aid, I think with this fat, I used some airbrush thinner because I completely run out of everything else. After leaving it overnight and spraying the edges black for neatness sake, it was time for priming. For this, I'm just using a grey gesso. This stuff is essentially artist primer. They use it to prime canvases before painting on them. Like your rattle can primer, 
It's got some real good tooth to it, so it helps paint adhere to the primer better. I mix this with water just to make sure it flows just that little bit easier and then gave the whole board two good coats. And stop. Then we need some of Asda's extra special black acrylic wash. The purpose of this is twofold. It's first of all to not back that grey because it's very grey. But mainly it's there to pick out all the mortar lines that we've got between the gaps in the stones where we put the sand and the grout. And as I am sure you have already guessed, it gets slapped everywhere. A couple of things worth noting. This wash is made with black acrylic paint. It's made with black acrylic ink. Its pigment tends to be much, much stronger. Black Magic Craft has a fairly good recipe. I also didn't apply this ink evenly. I tried to make it as sporadic and as bit random as I possibly could so the stones all didn't look the same. And then any excess or pooling, I just dabbed off with some kitchen towel. Kitchen, kitchen, kitchen towel. This turned out right, but I've got to say, I much prefer the texture of the sand over the grout. I want to keep this paint job as simple as I possibly can. So dry brushing, it is. And I'm going to use a knackered old makeup brush. And I want to be really careful about overloading the brush, so I'm going to spread the paint out on this cardboard first. The first layer of dry brushing is just exactly the same gesso I used to seal and prime all these bricks to start with. After that, I go back in with the dry brush, but this time with a 50-50 mixture of titanium white and the original gesso. This gives us a really solid foundation and as you can see, it's pretty effective. This ball on the left is the one I made before the video, and you can see the thickness of these bricks is much more variable, which, when it comes to dry brushing, you get better results. This is the same sand that I used earlier on. It's actually horticultural sand I use it for gardening, hence why I've got a 20 kilo bag. The great thing about this stuff for crafting is that you can get two different particle sizes from this big bag, just by using a household sieve. I probably should have worn a mask for this process though, because you can see some of these very fine particles actually floating around in the air. Of course, remember you can get different coloured sands. This can save you an absolute fortune. These bigger particles I'm going to save for later. I can use these either in another build, but more importantly, that's the particles that I really need for the garden. This stuff, I'm putting in the oven, 150 degrees centigrade, 20 minutes, half an hour, let it cool and it's ready to go. You don't need to use sand for this part of the build. You could in fact just use earth from outside, but treat it in the same way. It needs to be in bunny ears, sterilized before you start to use it. This is the reason why I put all that effort in to making sure that the brick patterns are essentially random and the depth of the bricks varies between each and every different brick. What I'm trying to do is use the sand to level out the surface, surface? To level out the surface, the rough cutting of the bricks and the completely 
random layering of them will allow this process, when it's finished, to look as natural as it possibly could. Once I was fairly happy with where I had positioned all of the sand, it was time for more of this old man's scenic glue. After letting that dry overnight, you can see we've now got some really nice texture on the board. The stones look like they've been covered by earth naturally. The next thing I want to do is take a couple of different brown washes just to give some variation to the sand. Use the lighter brown around the edges with the darker brown in the more in the central clumpy areas. I'm going to use my airbrush because it's easier. If you've used earth, you could completely skip this step. Skip this. You could. If you've used earth, you can completely skip this step. Oh, you could skip it anyway. It's not necessary. And we're going to cover the, all the sand up with flock in a bit. A quick color test first, and then we just crack on with it. I am pretty rough with this. I don't really care about overspray. If I get any, all it's going to do is help tint some of the brick stone pattern. Give it some more color, make it look more natural. Is it quicker than drinking a beer? Yes, yes it is. And these bags are leftovers from that video that I made a year ago. You should go and watch that after this one. All I'm doing is essentially just using the grinder as a blender to blend all of these flops together to make one not so uniform flop. Done it again. What I'm left with is a bag of mixed sawdust flock and a bag of fairly fine foam flock foam flock although not covered in that other video is made in exactly the same way but you have to let it dry naturally don't put it in the oven as well as this bit of leftover foam that I can use as clump foliage at this point I surprised myself by actually learning from past mistakes these big pieces of cardboard I should have done this earlier will stop glue going everywhere out me scoosh I started with the sawdust flock. I just allowed the sand that was already on the board to guide me as to where this should really be, but I was careful that I wanted to leave some of the sand around the edges of the greener areas exposed. Once I was satisfied with the sawdust, I turned my attention to the sponge flock. The focus of this was to keep some of this sponge flock as central to the larger greener areas. This was for a couple of reasons. I wanted it to have a slightly different colour, but more importantly, was that I wanted to add a different texture to the green areas. Now I leave this overnight to dry. As I did with the sand, I want to give a little bit more variation in the green areas. So I'm starting with a lighter green and again, going around the outside of these green areas, but I'm stippling it with a brush this time rather than using my airbrush. The thought behind using the brush, any pooling we can treat as being like an algified liquid. As with the sand, I followed the light green with the dark green in the thicker areas, and I also added a mild blue to some of the stone just to give a little hint of water and further variation.
Look at me using my big boy brain. Next, we're going back to the sand and some tiny gravel that's very close to the colour we painted the board. Sand first from a height like a chef. Then we're going to hit it with some of that fine foam flock that we had left from earlier. This helps blend everything together, gives us a nice layered effect. Then these tiny little grey stones, which I think is aquarium gravel, and I've no idea where I got it from, but I'm quite careful about where I place these on the board. I don't want these to get in the way of any terrain, but I certainly want them for the look. Next up, some tufts, but I've managed to block off my access to the super glue. I guess my big boy brain only gets powered up for a limited amount of time. When I see these on a wall, they have got some real Aztec vibes, something I really, really like. With all this greenery, I could put a load of hills on here and nothing would look out of place. And with no discernible street pattern, you can put buildings anywhere, so any orientation you like. And one of my pet hates is actually when I watch bat reps seeing buildings standing right in the middle of so I can use this board in an urban environment, a rural environment, with whatever system I want. Anything from Mordheim, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars Legion, Warhammer 40k. It has multiple uses, but I did build this board for one very specific purpose. <laughs> 